everybody. My name is Rafi Roan. I'm with the Weinberg Foundation. And um, thank you so much for coming to this bright spot with the fabulous David Rosenberg from Philadelphia, who is the Vice President for Programs and Strategy Development, I believe. And um, I, I know our time is valuable. I'm looking forward to learning from him and with all of you. So without further ado, um, we've only got 20 minutes together, so I'm going to pass it over to David. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for being on and, uh, and joining us today. Uh, it's always good to, uh, uh, to, to see uh, some familiar faces as well as a lot of new ones. Uh, sorry, I just want to um, just get on to my PowerPoint. Here it is. Okay. Rafi, can you see this? Okay, excellent. Uh, so hi, I'm David Rosenberg, uh, JFCS Senior Vice President for Programs and Strategy. And we're here with the uh, session for people with lived experiences. And um, so just to you know, provide you know, a little overview about JFCS, uh, and I'm sure this is similar with many of you, but we are uh, you know, a diverse uh, agency that focuses on a wide range of, uh, of services and, and needs population uh, and really you know, are dedicated to helping people of all backgrounds cope with life challenges. Uh, and our core program areas are individual and family services, which is basically like our case management and counseling program, uh, persons living with developmental disabilities, uh, education and outreach, uh, our closet, which is a, an innovative clothing program, uh, open Arms Adoption and our Holocaust Survivor Support Program. Uh, and the reason why I, I put this up here was just to show you know, the, that JFCS has a wide range of clients and a wide range of needs. And this is a, you know, a key reason why we felt that a client-centered approach is so important in the work that we do and to inform us with our learning. Um, so just uh, a little bit about client care, client-centered care itself. You know, uh, you know, so we're, we're committed to this approach and it's really there to help uh, us educate and inform our staff and leaders to guide program development. Uh, but most importantly, it's really to help to, uh, to strengthen the client care, uh, the client care manager uh, re relationship. Uh, and what, you know, we feel a client-centered uh, approach is really about is uh, empowering our clients Helping them to obtain positive well-being, uh, giving them choice, uh, increasing dignity, focusing on empowerment, as well as promoting independence and strengthening quality of life. And this this is all in the um, in the material in the PDF. And there's also a link which gives you more information. But just to add a little bit more is that this is an approach that's been adopted by many healthcare organizations. Uh, and, and their governing bodies, uh, as well as uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, so in terms of, uh, you know, Jewish family in uh, Children's Service of Greater Philadelphia, you know, we've kind of used this in a variety of ways. And our client, our client center journey really began with our Holocaust Survivor Support Group Program. Uh, like many of you, you might get funding from the Claims Conference. And our Claims Conference funding requires JFCS to manage a Holocaust Survivor Advisory Committee. Uh, you know, and the goal, the purpose of that is really to promote transparency between survivors and staff, to educate and empower the survivors and use their feedback to help direct how we uh, develop and implement services. Uh, the staff uh, you know, provide updates to the advisory council on the program, information about funding, news from the claims conference and decisions are made. So if, if you get claims conference funding, you, know, you would see, you know, recently the claims conference just uh, announced uh, a lot of new uh, you know, programs uh, and, and benefits for survivors. And as you can imagine, uh, you know, that raises a lot of questions and interest from our survivors. And so this advisory council helps us to communicate that information to the community and to answer questions. Um, you know, our council, when it was first formed, was originally about five to ten survivors, and now, uh, you know, unfortunately, the council's down to three, uh, you know, due to the aging of our population, 
And uh, the interesting thing is that currently all three members are from the former Soviet Union. And this really reflects uh, the survivor demographics in, in Philadelphia, where over two thirds of our survivor population we work with are from the former Soviet Union. Uh, and um, our FSU survivors are also much younger than our European survivors who are very frail and having difficulty remaining independent at home. Uh, and then I wanted to add that about four years ago, we further enhanced our client-centered approach. Uh, so like many of you here, we receive a grant from JFNA Center for Advancing Holocaust Survivor Care to provide trauma awareness training across the agency, as well as specialized training for the Holocaust Survivor Support Team. Uh, these sessions enabled JFCS to ensure services are provided in a person-centered, trauma-aware manner, and that the survivor experience can be considered throughout that program. Uh, recently, during the pandemic, we also had to switch how we even interacted with our clients. While we've been successful in using Zoom with other populations, it's been challenging for seniors and survivors uh, because many don't have laptops or smartphones or internet or even want to use it. And so in response, we decided to create a newsletter that includes information from staff, but more importantly, it also includes content from the survivors themselves. Now you may think that you know, a, newsletter, a newsletter is very basic, you know, very old school, but for the survivors, they've responded incredibly well to this and they look forward to it every month and they see it as, a, as an important connection for them uh, to the agency, as well as uh, you know, to for many of them the outside world because many of them have really not left uh, their homes over the past six, seven months. And I just wanna check if there are any uh, questions for a second. Um, Rafi, do you see any? I, I, I tried to, I saw- No some. questions yet. Okay, great. Um, so over the past year, JFCS has, fo has focused on more pronounced ways also to incorporate the client experience into direct client care. So in recent months, we solicited uh, key client feedback as we developed a new program to enhance care management for our programs that serve the broader community. Uh, due to funding, most of our care management uh, programs are for low-income households in the Jewish community. And um, the staff who oversee uh, the non-Jewish programs, they're really not used to that enhanced care management service. And so uh, to help get a sense of the needs and of, the, of, the, of that population, we met with clients from our parenting program, uh, which provides parenting skills to vulnerable households. And these participants you know, helped us to shape that program and to you know, even to name the program. Uh, and they, uh, you know, they really felt valued and part of the experience. And it'll help us as we provide this service in the community to get buy-in uh, for uh, when, when we fully implement it and look for this care manager to go and, and help uh, these clients you know, access benefits and, and, uh, and uh, receive other important services. Um, also, uh, we, this has been a key thing with our uh, client-centered approach has been a key with our voter registration efforts. So our Persons Living with Disabilities program, which is really focused on people with developmental and intellectual disabilities, uh, those participants, they wanted to learn about the voting process. Uh, they wanted to feel empowered and confident to go out and vote. And so our staff work with them uh, to create and conduct presentations in the community about how people register to vote and apply for ballots. And they did all the homework. Uh, we just guided them and then they created videos and then they went and they, they did presentations all throughout the community. Uh, and it was really something special. And uh, in the materials that we have, there's a link to, so you could see an example of one of our uh, clients giving this uh, educational session. And then also our elect teen parenting program developed an effort to talk with members uh, of their household and relatives about the importance of voting. You know, so here we have you know, a group of teens who uh, you know, they, they, um, they're pregnant or they're parenting uh, and you know, they might have some uh, home challenges. They might have uh, some life skill uh, challenges, you know, you know, issues with confidence and this program has, you know, given them a new way to, to feel confident and to feel empowered and to really go out 
and teach people uh, and teach their family about something important, uh, in this case, voting. Uh, I wanna spend the rest of my time focusing on the peer fellow model, uh, which is in the center of the screen, which offers a client-centered approach on both the peer fellow itself and how we generated a feedback from clients to develop the model. Uh, so JFCS is one of three members of our national agency to receive the Poverty Challenge Award, which provided six months of free consultation uh, to uh, develop an innovative idea. And why this is important in Philadelphia is because uh, so Philadelphia has the highest percentage of residents below federal poverty line of the 10 largest cities, which is approximately 380,000 Philadelphians. Uh, and uh, they have about an average income of uh, $46,000 uh, for non-poverty, uh, people non-poverty, and the average income of a person living in poverty is about $19,700. Uh, and in Jewish Philadelphia, uh, about over 29,000 Jewish households are 15% or at or below 200% of the poverty line. And so there's some real significant need. Uh, as you can imagine, um, you know, so we conduct comprehensive assessment of our clients and this slide shows some of the key barriers that they face. And I really wanna focus on where it says lack of engagement. Uh, what we mean by that is that we found that once a client receives help, many don't remain in touch uh, and only to return when they're facing a new crisis such as illness or eviction. Uh, and as a result, about one out of five or 20% of our clients return to us seeking help. Uh, and we knew that this was going to be a problem uh, and, and this is a challenge that we wanted to identify. And so what we did is we created what's known as uh, the fellows program, which is basically uh, an adaptation of peer uh, fellow programs that focus on, um, traditionally focus on people with mental illness and drug addiction. But in this case, um, the fellow program is going to help us enhance our key care management program. So as you see on this chart here, usually our process is that our care nav, our, um, a client will come in through our care navigation effort. They will um, go through an initial assessment and then our care managers will provide them with um, uh, benefits, uh, helping them connect with benefits, helping them uh, connect with other services. And our fellow uh, will be able to help enhance the, the, those services uh, and really spend key time with our clients, uh, adding an ad added layer of support and confidence uh, to our clients uh, and ultimately to help them uh, to reduce the, the, the chance of them going back into um, you know, needing more services from us. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, the care of uh, the fellow is, is a former client. So an example is someone like Faith. So Faith is uh, a woman in our community who uh, became uh, paralyzed by depression. Uh, she was caring for her parents in, in, in the home she grew up in. And then when her parents passed away, her siblings wanted to uh, sell the home. Uh, and as a result, she was, um, you know, risking homelessness and she was really struggling with depression and JFCS through our care management program really helped her uh, to stabilize her. And now, you know, she's, she wants to give back and she wants to be able to work um, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a stable job. And so somebody like this who, uh, you know, finished our program and is stable that these are the kind of people that we're, that we're looking for to provide us that, that, um, that fellow support. And she's going to help, um, you know, like our clients, you know, people like Faith who, who are facing various kinds of, of crises, uh, you know, throughout, throughout their lives. Um, hey, David, there is a yeah. question from Alan Kleinman. Who, who are the fellows? Are they volunteers? And what is the ratio of fellow to client? And what is the expectation of the time commitment of the fellow? Great question. So the fellow is, as I mentioned, is, is a for, will be a former JFCS client. Uh, they, they will not be a volunteer. Uh, they're going to receive a, like a paid fellowship from JFCS. And it is a, um, 
you know, essentially it's, it's going to be an internship and we created a, um, a, a un, like a partnership with our Jeff's Human Services to help provide some city funding to help pay uh, for, for that stipend. Uh, and then the, the fellow uh, will, um, uh, you know, uh, basically will be working like, like a JFCS employee. Uh, they, you know, the, the fellowship is, is less expensive, uh, you know, than, than a regular, uh, you know, staff employee, uh, you know, and so we also feel that this will create a savings in terms of, you know, at providing added, an added layer of care management while also, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, I guess realizing some, some savings. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the fellow will, you know, help, uh, you know, like support our clients and our ultimate goal is that it will help to reduce, uh, you know, our, our wait list time uh, by 50, by 50%. 50 it will also increase uh, the rapport uh, that, that we have with, um, with our clients and you know, ultimately we'll be looking at it to reduce uh, recidivism uh, with our, um, you know, with clients needing to return and it will improve stability and reduce care and help, uh, you know, really just uh, provide that layer. And the key thing that the fellow is gonna, you know, offer uh, to the clients is providing lived experience, um, providing confidence uh, and really sort of tell, telling the cl new clients like, hey, I've been through it. Uh, I will be able to, um, you know, I, if, I, if I finish the care management services, you can too. And so it's using that lived experience to build confidence and to really, uh, you know, share, uh, like, you know, um, like, like help them walk through these processes. And, you know, and the feeling that, that they can, that if they can, you know, apply for benefits at, at the county assistance agency, the client can too. Uh, and so, you know, so there's that that component as well, which is the critical one. The other thing I really want to address before we open it up to questions is um, a key thing in our development of this was creating focus groups uh, for our uh, you know, with with our clients so that we could learn what they would want to see in the fellow from a fellow. And so we held two client focus groups. And we also held one for our care management staff. Uh, you know, and you know, this is a real opportunity for them to share some of the things that they, that they, that they felt. So some of the things that our, we heard from our clients was that they felt that, that the waiting list is, is traumatic. Um, some of them expressed that, 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 that they wanted to see all of their options explored. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the peer fellow program, they shared that, that, that they love the idea because it, it would create an opportunity to be valued, to be connected, to be heard, uh, and you know, for the fellows to use their personal story with intention, uh, and that, that, the, that the fellow would be able to help others even with like a quick a telephone call uh, and to say, hey, I'm with you. Hey, David, I'm going to yeah. jump in really quickly. Sorry. Yeah, um, okay. I'm going to thank you ahead of time because we've got like another minute or two left. I'm going to paste in the in the um, chat the the links to the agenda so you can find the next second you know, the second success factor session. There is one question from Jessica if we can squeeze it in. Yeah. Um, we've been observing more levels of conflict, low levels of conflict among our clients, access services with our staff and volunteers. Wondering how you deal with issues of disagreement or conflict in this model. Is there a training or techniques you can recommend? And I would also recommend you, you, I think you guys know each other, so you could jump offline um, afterwards if you don't have time to finish it up. And I'm going to jump out and say thank you so much, David, for this bringing this bright spot, which is a really cool, innovative idea. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. You're David, muted, Rafi. What? Can you can you jump at that question in the last minute or so? Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought I thought. Okay. <laughs> um, let me just read it again.
So just out of curiosity, Jessica, are, are you referring to like conflict between um, the clients and the uh, excuse me, other pantries, we're just, we're seeing people just present with more frustration, more like we're, we're seeing that our staff need better support on de-escalation of issues. Um, and it just seems that given like the nature of this program, it seemed like it almost, I don't know, something about like the, just the nature of pairing people who may have, ex have troubles or issues with, within their lives, it seems like that might be something you come across, which is maybe people not having the best coping skills or mechanisms. And, and as leader, like the people you're tapping to be leaders or mentors or staff, like how do we support folks who are coming in contact with people who maybe don't have great coping skills and also don't have the tools themselves um, sure. to deal with that kind of frustration? Sure, so uh, the, um, the fellow, like so, we 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 we're still seeking funding for our first fellow. So this is still a model that that you know that we're exploring. But what I would say is, you know, the plan is that they're going to go through mm -hmm. uh, intense training, uh, you know, through like a, a peer fellow model, uh, and uh, you know, and and I th absolutely, you know, conflict conflict resolution and de-escalation is a training that you know uh, we uh, is is part of that, um, you know, and I. Uh, you know, it's something that like we do for our care management staff. And so, you know, we would seek to ha have the fellows do it as well. And, and I think you're right on point that this is something that, um, you know, because, you know, they ha had had that lived experience that they would be able to share that as well, uh, you know, with, um, you know, and, and to, to help them feel safe, a client to feel safe and to work it. But I think that, you know, going through that training is gonna be, you know, a critical first step before, uh, you know, they go into the pantry or or another place uh, to do that, so that they themselves don't feel overwhelmed and uh, you know not wanting you know and, and, and having like a bad taste in their mouth, you yeah. know, from the experience. Yeah, just uh, for anybody who could share, we've been kind of shopping a few different training models, um, but uh, it, we're just seeing it as an increased. Uh, again, just I don't know if it's. Changing seasons, you know, politic, the political climate, the challenges people are facing. I think it's all of them. There are just a lot more short fuses and we wanna make sure we wanna respect that people are going through a really hard time, but also equip our staff and our volunteers with the skills to handle that appropriately. Um, and so if anybody has, you know, any any training models that modules that they've liked or people they've used, um, I can put my email in the chat and, and I'd love, you know, for anyone who could share anything. Yeah, I'll ask our staff like who they've used, you know, in that area because it, it's a, it's an excellent point. I mean, like the interesting thing is for us in Philadelphia, uh, I, you know, most all of our services right now are, are virtual because of the pandemic, but I'll also talk with our staff who, who operate the pantries to see if, if that's something that they've encountered. Cause it's, yeah, I could see how people are feeling upset and, and angry in this. Uh, current state of things. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks. Great. Are there any other questions? You got like another two minutes before you have to jump to your next, uh, to our 120 second bright spot. Okay. David, any closing thoughts? No, I mean, I would just say, um, you know, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for their time. Uh, and, you know, and just to say that, um, you know, that this, this approach is something that, you know, we, we are looking to do, you know, throughout all, you know, all of our programs and, you know, and, and it's a work in progress, but that I think that, you know, if you can create even small ways and moments to, to, to talk with your clients and hear from them, uh, whether it's an advisory county, advisory council or just uh, like a quick focus group, I think it goes a long way for them to feel included and that their voice is heard. That's fantastic. And, and it's really a great segue for, for saying and understanding, look, like the, the, a lot of the answers are in the field. And, and um, you guys who are on direct services, it's not just in the field, but asking clients, what is it you need? Your lived experience should drive the response in many ways. So thank you again, David. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for coming. This was really instructive for me. And um, 